Good morning. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're new with us this morning, we're so glad that you are uh, here. I don't believe that anybody shows up into a gathering or a place of worship by accident. Um, Know that God has a plan for you, and we're excited that you're here and to be a part of that. If you are new to the Bayshore family, I just want to say I'm excited for what you just witnessed us, witnessed the process of the calling of leadership and the ending of one season. I want to say thank you to Ellis Miller Sr., wherever you're at. Ellis has led us for the, Pat, there he is, over there somewhere. I see Sr., Sr., there you are, way back there. Ellis has been our chair for the past two years and has led us well, and I'm excited for Beth and for the calling on her life to lead us in the next two years. If you're new, one of the things that, is, that is, was exciting for me in processing the transition to Bayshore was leadership. And the fact that something that was very heavy on my heart is that I did not want to be a part of a family or a part of a process where the responsibility, the empowerment, the power of leadership rested solely on one person's shoulders. One, it can lead uh, to an ego. The other, it can lead to burnout. And so I was very careful about that. And I love our process of leadership here. If you're new, we have uh, four pastors and five leadership team members who make up our leadership team, and we lead together. And we so we res- we with the responsibility of leadership lands not just on one person, but it lands on the group collectively. And I love our leadership team. I love the process. I love the discernment, especially in a year like 2020. It's been exciting. Uh, some some leadership models they're not wrong, but it lands on one person solely, it's maybe the pastor or the chair. And here I truly, truly love that the responsibility is shouldered by a team. And so uh, I believe in it, and I think that you can have confidence in the leadership of this church because of that. I think that they have proven themselves well. They have supported us as pastors, especially in the year of COVID. Um, and I'm excited about that. So keep them in your prayer. Keep us pastors in your prayers as we continue to forge forward. This ver- the verses I'm going to start off with this morning aren't on the screen. For that, Rhonda, you don't have to go to them right now. These verses came to me quickly this morning. I want to ask you guys a question before we jump in. Uh, you can turn, turn to John chapter 3 because we are going to land there in just a few moments. But in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us hold tightly with wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of good love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another. Listen, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I believe that these verses this morning, as they were laid on my heart, and as I opened up, forgetting what the passage actually read, but the, the, actual, uh, the actual passage was laid on my heart. The Lord said, I need you to open to Hebrews chapter 10 real quick. And I started reading down through Hebrews 10, and these verses just came out at me. And I think as we go through the process of this next week, as Tuesday hits, I believe that we as a church need to hold tightly Listen carefully, hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. As we wake up Wednesday morning, we know that the hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Nothing that happens Tuesday is going to change that, correct? Correct? We need to be a little more confident than that this morning. Nothing that happens Tuesday... Nothing that happens Tuesday should waver our faith or our hope. Amen? Amen. And then let me ask you this question. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. One of the, one of the translations is of, of this said, let's continue to spur one another on. I don't know if there's a whole lot of encouragement happening in our society lately. I feel like as I have decided to fast... From all of the media outlets this past week, I haven't opened a media outlet. I haven't opened my Facebook page to any of the media outlets. I've unfollowed on Instagram specifically so that I could keep my focus on who I should be focused on. And the Lord encouraged me this week that we need to be an encouragement to one another. 
There's so much tension happening. There's so much, so many disagreements even inside the church right now. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews said, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And so this morning, I want to ask you guys the, this question as your pastor and as your shepherd, how can we inspire you? How can we inspire you to acts of service and acts of work? And I'm not saying that you're not doing it, but the writer here says to continue to do it, to continue to inspire one another to love and to good works and to acts of service. And I think if we're not careful, we're becoming distracted to that calling on our lives. I don't uh, support many documentaries or many things that are made, especially outside of the Christian world. But there is one right now, and I'm, I want to be very careful with this because I don't want to support a, a platform and I know some of you are, are very anti this platform right now, but there's a document, there's a, a, uh, a documentary right now that came out called The Social Dilemma. The Social Dilemma. I'll let you Google that. You can find the platform. You can find where it's at. But the, document, the documentary basically shows from a non-Christian perspective how distracting, how distracting our social media platforms have become. And one of the things, one of the quotes that hit me in looking at this, uh, looking at this show or this, this hour and a half documentation or documentary on the social dilemma is that one of the creators of the, actually I believe, I could be wrong about this, I believe he's the very person that came up with the concept of the like button. Okay, He came up with the concept of the like button on your phone where you can like things. Said that, he, he made this simple, he said, my task for about 10 years was to steal your time. That my win in life was to get you to look at this more and more and more. My, his, his win was to steal our time. And I had to think as I was listening to this, I'm like, that's the enemy's task. That is Satan's task. That is the, 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 the weapon that he uses the most against us is distraction. And he can create something over here to get, his, to get us, God's kingdom, looking here while he does something here. And if the Lord desires this intimate, passionate, expressful uh, relationship with Christ, and he knows he can't get you to doubt, he knows he can't get you to walk away from Christ, he knows he can, get you to, to, he knows he can distract you from it. And so as I look at this and and the encouragement this morning from Hebrews is let us hold tightly without wavering. I think in the time period that we're living in, wavering is something that we have to be very careful about. Because I feel like sometimes, and I don't know if you feel this way, I feel like sometimes I'm walking, I'm walking a balance beam through life right now. And you have voices on this side and we have voices on this side and the Lord wants us to walk the straight and narrow and, and, and I feel like I can waver. If I'm not careful, if I'm not, if I'm not placing my hope in what we're talking about this morning, if I'm placing my hope in the media outlets, if I'm placing my hope in politicians, if I'm placing my hope in, in the economy, if I'm placing my hope in the government, we will waver because those things are going to change. You just saw a leadership change in our own structure as a church this morning. We're going to see leadership change again at the first of this year. But the Lord says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For, and I love this truth. Say this to somebody next to you, for God can be trusted. I haven't had you do this in a while. Say to your neighbor, God can be trusted. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. At a weird week... I won't even get into all the details. I had this crazy week. We just came out of this three to four week time of, being, of talking about being anxious for nothing. Being anxious for nothing, but, for, but in everything with prayer and petition, let your requests be known to God. A crazy week where I had a hard time doing that. I felt so anxious. Even this morning, there's an anxiousness in me. And I felt like the enemy came against me because of, because of the anxiousness that he can place inside of me. And because of that, sometimes I can tend to waver. And this morning, the Lord just gently reminded me that he can be trusted. He can be trusted. He is who we should place all of our trust in. Amen? Amen. So we're going to jump to John chapter 3. 
one of the most famous stories in the Bible. We are going to look at one of the most famous, if not the famous verse in the Bible. In fact, I looked up and they did a poll years ago and they found that those that aren't walking with Christ, about 70% could still quote this verse even if they hadn't attended church, even if they weren't walking with Christ. And you know that the verse is John 3.16. We're going to take a moment. We're going to look at that in just a second. So as we open to John chapter 3, let's read this together. There was a man named Nicodemus, who is a very important figure in this story, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. I, I think it's ironic that, that I think it's important that we see the position that Nicodemus was in at this point. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus as, at night because he's a Pharisee and he didn't want his other Pharisaical friends or relationships to see him. And so he comes to Jesus at night and he comes to Jesus on the very night after he's cleansed the temple. After Jesus shows up in the triumphant entry and comes into Jerusalem and he walks into the temple and he sees that the temple is being defiled and his heart is literally broken for what's happening in the temple and he turns the tables over and he, he throws the den, calls the, a den of thieves and throws them out and says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. On that very night, Nicodemus shows up. Nicodemus, and, I, and we don't know what time it is, uh, as I picture this, as I picture Nicodemus walking from his house or his location to Jesus, I see him ducking in the shadows, I see him getting to the place where Jesus is at, and he kind of carefully sneaks in, I, I see him standing at the doorway, and then kind of knocking gently, and when the door opens, he slips in so that nobody sees him. Under the cover of night, Nicodemus comes because something Something in Nicodemus had him questioning this man that he saw performing miracles. This man that he saw teaching. It's interesting that in our time period, we can, and, and I love this about our technology, we can listen, we can, we can hear, we can watch any pastor that's online, any ministry leader, any evangelist. I would say probably on on, on average, I get about four to five texts or emails from somebody saying, hey, Andy, have you seen this? Hey, Andy, have you heard this? Hey, Andy, you need to listen to this. And the one I love the most is, hey, Bayshore really needs to watch this. And all of that is good. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But in this time period, that was happening to Jesus. People were coming and talking at their, their workplaces. People were coming around their dining room tables, and they were saying, hey, have you heard this guy Jesus teaching over here? Now, they didn't have smartphones and they didn't have computers and they didn't have devices to watch Jesus, so they, they physically had to go because Jesus was a charismatic person. He had a, an inspirational personality about him. He had a directness and he had a boldness and people wanted to hear him. He taught with an authority like never, never heard before. And so Nicodemus had experienced this on several occasions. Nicodemus had experienced the confrontations that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious rulers of that time. But something in Nicodemus, despite all of that, had him questioning. We know that at the end of, at the, end of the crucifixion, Nicodemus was one of the guys that came with perfume and spices and helped take Jesus down off the cross and lay him in the tomb. We know that Nicodemus was the one that spoke up as the Sadducees and the religious rulers were trying to come against Jesus, he's the one that spoke up. And, and, and within speaking up about Jesus, you get this feeling that something was churning inside of Nicodemus. And so all of that had Nicodemus in this in, in investigative attitude or this investigative approach. And so he comes to Jesus in the dark of the night and he says, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. So Nicodemus recognizes, he doesn't recognize him as the son of God yet, but he recognizes him as God being with him. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. 
The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. See, Nicodemus grew up in a, in a rules and, and regulations, Old Testament relationship with Christ. And his rules and his regulations, the, the Old Testament law, the Torah, was extremely important to him. And I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus shows up and he says, listen, we're, 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 this is a transitional moment in history. This is a transitional time because your way of thinking, the law that, that, that you followed is good in that it points out your sinful nature. I've been studying the book of Romans lately. And if, you, if you've ever read the book of Romans, chapters 1, 2, and 3, you realize like, you want to walk away because it, it, it speaks to the depravity of man. It, st- it speaks to the sin of man. You see things like we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin of death. You see verses that say, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And you, as you look at Romans, the first three chapters, you want to give up because it's, it's not the most encouraging chapter. But then you get past Romans chapter 3 and you start hearing about God's grace and about God's love and about God's mercy for his people and the fact that, yes, there is a depravity of man, but despite that, God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And it's this conversation that you get pointed back to because of that. Jesus rep- replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can rep- pre- reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. This obviously confuses Nicodemus because he says, how are these things possible? How are these things possible? And Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can I possibly, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. He makes the picture of through his death and through his resurrection, the Holy Spirit will be released and there'll be this tearing of the veil and there'll be this entering into this kingdom of God that he is discussing. For this is how God loved the world. And here we go. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. I want to read that again. There is no judgment. There is no shame. There is no death. There is, no, there is nothing that can come against you who believes in him on the eternal side. Here on earth, yes, we are going to get sick. Here on earth, we are going to go through trials and tribulations. Here on earth, we will have trouble. But if we take heart in God, there is no judgment. There is no judgment. Not even death can separate us from the wonderful love of God. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And that judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Could you pray with me this morning? I want to take just a moment and I want to pause. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that to the depth of your core this morning? Jesus is the author and finisher of our life. Everything was created by him, everything was created through him, and everything was created for him. And through him, we have new life. And this morning, Lord, we thank you for that new life. Because it's through you that we have hope. It's through you that we have justification from our sins. It's through you that we have sanctification as we walk through this world. And it's through you who we will ultimately have glorification as you return again, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that. Amen.
Amen. So as we enter into a week where we're searching for the answer, and we're going to put our name in approval beside somebody, not just for president, but for other, for other platforms as well, I think it's important to know who is in control. And I think it's important to look back and remember what life is about. We talked a little bit about this last week. I know I'm praying one way this week. I know that I'm putting my hope and my prayers, praying for one, one outcome. And I, I would have guessed that many of you are praying for that same outcome. But I have to ask my question because I heard this said by a prominent pastor a few weeks ago. And I want to I position us into this place for the next whatever years. That it's time, church. It's time to pray for the White House. And I believe many of you have done that in the past few years. One of the things that's been exciting for the past four years is that I believe the church has risen up and begun to pray again. But this prominent pastor on a prayer time in Washington said, Listen, it's time for the change not to just be expected in that house, but for the change to begin in our houses, in our houses of worship, in our houses around our dinner table as we pray, as we pray for Jesus to be known in this country again. As we pray for Jesus to be known in this country again. Is there more tension than ever before? Yes. Is there more tension between the church and between government? Yes. Do I believe that that tension is going to go away on Tuesday? I don't. I believe that that tension will slowly begin to grow no matter what. And I believe that the answer, I believe that our answer, church, is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed it in him should not perish but have everlasting life because God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. And whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, get to enter into an unearthly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. We get to become citizens of heaven. And we get to conduct ourselves in a powerful, spiritual way. And no matter what happens this week, no matter what happens in our local elections, no matter what happens in our national elections, and I'm not saying we, we shouldn't go out and vote, and I'm not saying we shouldn't pray, yes, 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 do that. But we need to pray the name of Jesus Christ over our nation again. We need to pray that revival comes to our nation again. We need to pray that the, the hurt and the pain and the suffering that we're seeing, the tension, we need to pray Jesus Christ, the hope of God, the hope of glory into those situations. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow, only two people are going to clap for that. That's all right. That's all right. I'm excited for where we are at because, listen carefully, because tension tends to make the church rise up. Because without tension, we have a tendency of sitting back in our recliners, or we have tendencies of, of realizing or forgetting that life isn't necessarily just about us. That life is about Jesus Christ. That life is just about Jesus Christ. At the age of eight, in Goshen, Indiana, at First Assembly of God, right behind a McDonald's on Route 33, in a vacation Bible school, I accepted Christ for the very first time. I even looked this church up, their website, earlier this week, and I was able to see a picture inside the sanctuary of the very spot that at eight years old, I knelt down and accepted Jesus Christ, where he no longer became just a Sunday school lesson. He no longer became just a flannel graph that my Sunday school teacher was talking about. He became real to me. Problem is, we moved from Indiana to Florida, and I lost my way just a bit. I call, these, I call the years between eight years old and 17-year-old my gap years. And in my gap years, I was filled with hurt. I was filled with anger. I was insecure. I was jealous. Uh, I was dishonest. I was disloyal. I wasn't a good friend to those that were around me in those years. And then somewhere God got a hold of me at the age of 17 again. You guys know the story from there. And I put, God put me on my face before him again and I rededicated my life at 17. And one of my prayers and one of those things that, that Pastor Tom Reno at that time led me through is I didn't want to just be a ho-hum Christian. One of the things that, 
that was hard for me in that time period was I knew several people that were Christians but weren't really walking or acting like it. And I wasn't, the, I, I'm not, the, I'm the type of person that, I, and I hope you can see this in me, that I'm not going to stand for something that I don't believe in. And I'm not going to stand for something that I can't be passionate about. I'm not going to stand for something that I can't be excited about. I have a tendency of putting all of myself into something to the point where I hurt myself sometimes in it. Those of you that knew me in my teenage years, you might have seen that. You know some of the ridiculous things that I did during my dishonest years and my insecure years and my jealous years. I was a passionate, jealous person. I was a passionate, disloyal person. I was a passionate, angry person. I was a passionate, hurt person. And for me, I I couldn't accept something until it became real to me. And so because of that, I think it took much longer for my youth pastor and for some of the pastors and some of the friends around me to convince me And finally, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and introduced me to new life at that time. But I look back at those gap years and I wonder, I wonder if there's those in the room that would resonate with that right now, that you accepted Christ at one point in your life and yet you've fallen, not away, but maybe you've been distracted. Maybe you've, maybe you've become a little disloyal to uh, your faith in the church Maybe you've gotten sucked away by temptations or things like that. I'm thinking of the parable of the soils and Jesus' is teaching there. And one of the things I like about the time period that we're in is because tension uh, makes us, tension has a tendency of making us take notice. When things start to go uh, awry around us, we, stand, we tend to start taking notice. And I love that the church has begun to take notice a little bit more in 2020. The church has begun to pray and stand up for itself a little bit more in 2020. So when people ask me all the time, do I believe that God brought COVID or do I believe that God allowed or or brought 2020 to us? I say, whether or not he did, he definitely wants to make it matter. He definitely wants to make 2020 matter. He definitely wants to make COVID matter because tension tension has a tendency of, of turning us back around and what we didn't realize was going on underneath Underneath everything, we now see it. Tension has, God uses tension to bring clarity to our lives. And we're all of a sudden, we're like, oh, wait a minute. I might have an issue here. I might need to speak into that. I might need to pray into that. I might need to step into that. I might need to, to speak out against that. That's why we talked about being, uh, uh, being, the verse just slipped my mind, being as cunning as snakes and as innocent as doves last week, using discernment in this time period. I want to remind us really quickly this morning of of just what we have in new life in Jesus Christ. And I want you to write the words justified, if you're writing them down, if you can type them. I want you to write the words sanctified and glorified. Sanctified and glorified. And we're going to move really, really, really quickly here. As we enter into new life with Jesus Christ, we experience freedom from the penalty of our sins. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I love the way that the writer of Romans, in different verses, it gives us the bad news and then the good news. For the wages of sin is death. Without Jesus Christ, we are still stuck in, 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 we are not in right standing with God. If we look at the aspects of justification real quick, we have through, through justification, we have forgiveness of sins, we have the removal of guilt, and we have the imputation of righteousness. And the forg- one of the things that I want to remind us, church, when it comes to God, that we don't have in each other. See, if I look out and, and one of you wrongs me or one of you sins against me, I don't necessarily have the ability to forget that. I would hope and pray that I have the the ability to forgive, but I don't necessarily have the ability to forget. The crazy thing about the the justification of God putting us back into right standing with him is God has the ability to wipe it off as if it never happened. Like he removes our sins as as far as the east is from the west. He blots it out as if it never happened. The Andy in those gap years, the Andy between 8 and 17, to God, never happened. Doesn't hold it against me. He's put me back into right standing with him. And thus, because of that, I don't have to have shame for any of it. For any of it. That's an incredible truth to live 
by 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone. The old is gone. I believe that there's some in here this morning, you need to hear that. God's not remembering what you did back then. God only cares about what he has for you tomorrow. What he has for you in your future. (laughs) And that you're in right standing with him. I heard a pastor this week say that the mistake that we can make as Christians is we, we have a tendency of preaching the gospel so that you don't go to hell. We have a tendency of preaching the gospel so that you don't go to hell. But really, ultimately, ultimately the scariest thing in our life is we preach the gospel, the connection with Jesus, so we're back in right relationship with Jesus and him. Like God sent Jesus Christ not to save us from hell, not ultimately, but to bring us into relationship with him. Like God cared so much about you. God cared so much about you. God cared so much about you guys that he didn't want to be away from you. To him, he wants a relationship with us. To him, he, want, he, he desires us so much that he can't fathom being away from us that he sends Jesus Christ so that we would sit with him so that we would be right with him again it's not it's not as to God it's not wanting to send you to hell not even wanting to send anybody there the Bible says that God God hates the thought of not having a relationship with you and I love that part about Jesus for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life Think about this, fathers. Those are pretty big lengths to go to. Anybody in here willing to give their firstborn son that so somebody else would live? A healthy firstborn son so that, so, so that somebody else would live. That's what God did with Jesus. A healthy firstborn son so that we could live. So that we can live. And I believe that that tension wakes us up to how far we've fallen from that desire from that desire second new life gives us freedom from power of our sins sanctified sanctification let's back up a verse in romans to verse 22 and the writer has just talked a little bit about the old way and what what he used to be a slave to and it says but now you are free from the power of sin and become slaves of god now you do the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. There's some aspects within sanctification that are all awesome and that are always at work. And one of those is, as soon as we accept Christ, we have instantaneous sanctification, which means, I just talked about this, over here we were in death, over here our sins were counted against us. Instantly when we believe and confess in Jesus, instantly we're sanctified. Instantly we're sanctified. But we know that we have this flesh We know that we have this outside interior. We know that we have these motives that are contrary to God. So there's a progressive sanctification going on. We have our right standing instantaneously. And then we have what God, this continued maturity of spiritual growth. Where as you're on this road, knowledge is downloaded to you. Revelation comes as you're reading the word. And as you're you're studying, as you're praying, as you're learning to worship, as you're communing with your family. All of a sudden things you didn't know before. Aspects of Christianity that you didn't know before are revealed to you all for the fact, all for your sanctification, all for your maturity and your growth. And then three, ultimately, the ultimate sanctification will be our er eternal state when we are transformed through death into our glorious state, which brings us to our last and final benefit, you could call it, feature, you could call it. There will be a day, church, and this should excite us. Like, as I processed this this week and as I prayed about this this week, this is going to sound really weird, and I've said this to you guys before. We talked, there's a few of us that talked about this during or before church. I actually got excited about death. I actually got excited. Anybody excited about death? Any, anybody excited about eternal life? Okay, you're excited about that. Right? Everybody wants to live forever. We just don't want to have to die to do it, right? Like, I'm really, really hoping Jesus comes back during my lifetime. Because that whole death thing, it's scary. 
I have had a couple moments in the past few years where there were things with me health-wise that I'm like, oh my. You know, you hear the word cancer, you hear the word tumor, you hear the word this, you hear the word that, and it brings, and, and our fear is death. But I think if we're not careful, we, we, we fear it because we don't see it as transition, we see it as an end. And I got excited this week as I talk about the glory, as I began to think through the glorification process that is death. See, listen to this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 through 23. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, who is Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Anybody excited about Jesus returning? I really hope that's not the greeting you give him when he gets here. Anybody excited about Jesus returning? Come on. You know, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was given the greatest assignment of any man, I think. Like John the Baptist got to live on the same soil, got to, got to walk the same paths, got to go to the same restaurants. I'm pretty sure him and Jesus hung out at Chick-fil-A. I would have if I were him. John the Baptist got to proclaim the coming of the Messiah, right? Like John the Baptist was prophesied as much as, well, not as much as Jesus in the Old Testament, but just like Jesus in the Old Testament, that he would proclaim the coming of the Messiah. Here's the exciting thing, church. The spirit of John the Baptist should be in every single one of us. And here's why. Because we get to proclaim the second coming of Jesus Christ. I had a pastor about a year ago. You've heard me say this a couple of times throughout the past year. I had a pastor as we were talking a couple, about a year ago that said, you know what's crazy is we don't teach the second coming of Christ in our church services anymore. And it hit me. He's like, I'm like, he's right. Like, and because from, from my vantage point, from our vantage point as teachers and as pastors, we don't necessarily talk about the second coming of Christ, so maybe we're not as excited about it as we should be, and maybe we don't proclaim it because we're just simply not teaching about it up here. But I don't know about you, here's what's exciting and here's what keeps my trust and trusting in God no matter what happens on Tuesday, is I know that Jesus is coming back again. I know that there's a kingdom that he died for that, is, that, that he is being patient and adding to the numbers. And I get to proclaim that Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen. Amen. So when my neighbor last night dresses up in this weird costume of this headless whatever, and as I'm walking by him, I'm like, oh, Jesus loves you, dude. Jesus loves you, even in that outfit. Church, can we get back to proclaiming that? Can we get back that no matter what happens in society, and, and please, 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 please don't get me wrong. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to our society and our culture, I think the decay is there. I think the decay is there. And I don't know that, I, I don't know that, that anything, in fact, I do know nothing but Jesus Christ and the church rising up and loving on our community is going to, going to heal that. And I know that, that that's probably not the most hopeful or the best news that I, I just think we're too far gone. And I think part of it, like you look at history, you look at the nations and you look at the kingdoms that did and progressed the way that we have progressed the past 40 years, taking prayer out of schools, allowing for abortions, beginning to take God out of our justice systems. It's been, we've been on a slippery slope for 40, 50, 60 years. And it scares me that, that we're too far gone and that the tension that this nation is under now is the mere fact that the nation just slowly turned its face away from God. And we've got a book up here. I've got an Old, I've got an old Testament First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, that shows us king after king, kingdom after kingdom. What happened to the nation of Israel? What happened to the nation of Judah? What happened to the Roman Empire? What happened to all these these historical kingdoms when that happened? And I think we're right on the doorstep of a slippery slope that our nation. I don't know. I don't know that our nation pulls out of it 
at least not without the church rising up and speaking the name of Jesus Christ, which, again, I'm excited for the tension because the tension has allowed us to take notice, and that's what I see us doing. And it's good, and it's good. There's three different aspects of glorification that I want us to take a real quick look at, and then we're going to close. I love the fact that there will be a day that physically I will be given a new body. But physically I will be glorified with Christ. But this was set in motion by Christ's death and resurrection 2,000 years ago. It continues with our confession, our devotion, and our worship. Our confession, our devotion, and our worship of the Lord. And it will be completed with Christ's return. So 2,000 years ago, God gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him is, is set upon this road to glorification which continues with our devotion and our worship, our belief and our, our building of our faith in him. And it will be completed when Christ returns. So we're in this, we're in this, this window, we're in this process of sanctification, we're in this window where devotion and worship, we're beyond confession but now the Lord is looking to us to deepen our devotion. The Lord is looking to us to, to impassion our worship. And he does that through a body of believers coming together like we're doing right now on Sunday mornings. It's why in Hebrews 10, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Because we can't, I don't know about you, but the next four years, the next eight years, the next 12 years, the next 16 years, I don't want to walk this world alone. I don't want to walk this country alone. And I'm thankful that God has called me to a body of believers that loves Jesus Christ and, and is wanting to dive deeper into devotion and worship of Him. But I think back, I think back to the, the tech developer's words that said, my job, my job is to steal your time. Church, realize the enemy's job is to steal our devotion. The enemy's job is to steal our worship because he knows it slows down our sanctification process. And if he can get us to not look like Jesus, to not look like Jesus, then we're not going to be John the Baptist in any way, shape, or form. I had, I had somebody ask me this last week. After, remember I said, I wonder what Jesus would say to us if he was here. I wonder what Paul would say to us if he taught us this morning. I wonder what Peter would say. Somebody afterwards said, yeah, I had to sit and think. What do you think John the Baptist would say to us in this time period? Continued with our confession, our devotion, and our worship. Worship team, if you all would come up. Here's what my prayer has been this morning. I've been praying all week that in this moment right now, what caught my attention at the age of 17 was the fact that, that I felt unloved and the fact that somewhere in my heart as, as Randy Miller and Tom Reno were on either side of me saying, Jesus loves you, and I, I would push back on them and say, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means. Like, I, don't feel, I, don't, I don't feel like there's any earthly love around me, and you keep saying that this Jesus loves me. And both men, without talking, wrapped their arms around me, simultaneously hugged me, and cried over me. And in that moment, in that act... The Holy Spirit and those two men drove deep down inside of me and showed me what it meant to be loved. And that I'm worthy of that love. It's the insecurity and the hurt and the pain and the anger in me. That there was a love that could wash all of that away. And one of the men, I don't remember which one of it said, the end of it prophetically said, the Lord is saying to you, Andy, you will, 
declare this love in front of hundreds and hundreds of people throughout your life. Never allow your passion to die out. So I wonder this morning, is there anyone in the room who's allowed themselves, whether it's to be distracted by or, or, or stolen from, or has your passion died out? You've been in this church your whole life. You've been in this church five days, five Sundays, three Sundays. devotion to and your passion for Christ has been slowly sucked away from you. Go ahead and close your eyes for a sec. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God came to free us from the penalty of our sin come to free us from the power of our sin and he ultimately will come back again to free us from the presence of sin and if there's anything that we should be hoping and praying for this week it's that Jesus would impassion his church to fill it with devotion again re-impassion his church to feel and sense and express his love once again. This morning, don't, if you're struggling in any area that I just talked about, don't walk out of here. Don't walk out of here without allowing the Lord to reignite that passion and devotion inside of you. you're struggling in spending time in the word, if you're struggling in spending time in prayer, if you're struggling in any aspect of your faith, don't walk out of here without the Lord revealing himself to you again and repassioning you. Father God, I thank you for sending your one and only son and setting a belief system inside of us, Lord, that can be trusted that can be worshipped that we can be devoted to that's out of this world that's out of this world Lord. if you would stand with me this morning God loves you. He desires a deep, devoted, passionate relationship with you. He's seated you. He's placed a seat for you at his table. It's up to us to walk into it and accept it. As we worship in the last few moments of today's service, I invite you, if you want prayer, come forward. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been struggling with. Don't leave this room still struggling with it. If you felt lukewarm or lethargic in your faith, don't leave this room lukewarm or lethargic. For God so loved this world, that he gave his only son so that we could walk passionately so that we could breathe the light to this world don't leave here struggling father hear us as we worship you